Hello and uh, welcome to the next webinar in a series that's being presented by the Electricity Sector Climate Information or ESCI project. For those who haven't been exposed to the project, the ESCI project is funded through the Department of in Industry, Science, Energy and Resources and is undertaken by CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology in conjunction with the Australian Energy Market Operator, AEMO. My name is Rebecca Gregory and I'm the CSIRO project manager for this project. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention a couple of housekeeping items. As you can see, you've all been muted and have the videos turned off. It's to reduce feedback and distractions for the presenter. But please use the chat function on the Zoom toolbar to ask questions throughout the webinar and these will be answered by Carl during a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And we'll address as many as possible. Um, Today's webinar is entitled The Influence of Climate Change on the Australian Bushfire Season and is being presented by Carl Braganza from the Bureau of Meteorology. Carl is the Head of Climate Services at the Bureau and is leading the ESCI project work into extreme event modelling. So I'll hand it over to Carl to start the presentation. Um, thanks Rebecca. So we're going to have a bit of a look back at the 2019-2020 um, fire season and obviously um, the, the amazing fire events that we saw um, over Christmas and New Year. Um, we're going to look at the influence of both natural variability and climate change on those events. And then we're going to have a little bit of a look at what this means for planning for the future. So this is a high-res satellite image of um, the fires that occurred at the end of December in 2019. Um, what you can see here are the fire plumes um, growing and taking off um, in eastern Victoria and in on the south coast of New South Wales. Um, so these were obviously um, quite significant events. What we, we know now, um, how many um, animals, um, for example, perished in these fires, um, what sort of impact it had on the vegetation. And you can see from the size of these smoke plumes, um, just how much vegetation or fuel um, was being consumed by these fires. Um, you can also see these fires start to generate their own weather. So what we call fire generated thunderstorms or pyrocumulonimbus. Um, kicking off by the size of the fires themselves um, and generating enough smoke to actually circumnavigate the globe. So um, the satellites that track particular aerosols in the atmosphere um, could track these smoke plumes not just over to New Zealand or to South America but right the way around um, and coming back towards Australia from the west. So to start with, it's good to set the scene here. And what we know about Australian climate is that it's naturally highly variable. And when we talk about that variability, we're mostly talking about rainfall variability. So <clears throat> unlike a lot of continents um, in, in, on the globe, Australia has very coherent rainfall variability. And that means up to half or three quarters of the continent can swing between um, drought and dry periods and very wet periods and flooding. And that's certainly been the experience um, for Australia um, for thousands of years and there's some pictures here from um, early European settlement through to, through to now where we can see the impact of um, fires, dust storms and drought um, as well as significant flooding events. The graph here shows rainfall variability in Australia expressed as anomalies. So these are departures from the 1961 to 1990 average. Um, the blue bars here are where it's rained more than average in Australia and the red bars is where it's rained less than average. So what we can see is a reasonably arid continent um, interspersed by these very wet periods. And it's notable that those wet periods seem to have gotten wetter since the 1970s. Um, it's also instructive to look at why we get that variability and what that variability was doing um, leading into the 2019-2020 bushfire season. So this is an animation of sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean. Um, what we have is a cycle called ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, where we see a movement of warm waters from, generally from one side of the Pacific to the other. Um, and that movement of warm water tends to drag um, weather systems around with it. As you can see, it's a massive movement of water. So this is um, the classic warm tongue associated with, with what's called an El Nino event in the Pacific. Um, and it's large enough to influence global climate um, for one or two years. Um, certainly for Australia, which sits just to the west of the Indian, uh, of the Pacific Ocean, um, it's a very significant um, impactor on our climate. In fact, the largest natural influence on our climate. So just to explain how El Nino or ENSO works, um, typically, and the, the, the um, map in the middle there shows um, 
what's called the neutral phase of ENSO or the, the conditions that prevail most commonly. So most often we have trade winds that blow from east to west across the Pacific. Um, they help pile up warm water in what's known as the Western Pacific Warm Pool to the north of Australia. Um, that warm water is conducive to atmospheric convection, so rising air that takes the moisture up into the atmosphere and we tend to get rainfall following that warm water. So to the north of Australia, it's typically a very wet and warm part of the world and it is normally that way during the neutral phase of, of, of events. So on the left there, we've got um, an event called the La Nina event. So uh, ENSO has three phases. Um, La Nina is essentially an intensification of the neutral phase. So the trade winds still blow from east to west across the Pacific, but they intensify. Um, they pile more warm water in, in the Western Pacific um, and we get enhanced convection. So typically for La Nina events and almost certainly for strong La Nina events, we get um, rainfall and flooding over the eastern half of Australia. The opposite of that is an El Nino event. So during an El Nino event, the trade winds weaken or actually reverse, um, and we actually shift the warm water from one side of the Pacific to the other. So under an El Nino, the warmest water sits to the east of the Pacific Ocean Basin off the coast of South America. The atmospheric moisture follows that water, and we tend to have heavy rainfall over um, South America and the southern parts of North America, and a greatly reduced chance of rainfall over Eastern Australia, and quite often drought as well. In terms of what ENSO was doing leading into the 2019 season, um, it was in its neutral phase. So we weren't getting much help or much of a push from either El Nino or La Nina um, leading into the 2019 summer. There is a cohort of ENSO in the Pacific Ocean, in the Indian Ocean, sorry, and it's known as the Indian Ocean Dipole or IOD. Um, so similarly to ENSO, um, it has a neutral phase and that neutral phase tends to push winds from west to east, this time across the Indian Ocean, and we tend to get atmospheric convection and rainfall um, over the Indonesian archipelago, so to the northwest of Australia. Um, under the negative phase of the IOD, um, we tend to intensify that pattern. So we have warmer than normal water to the northwest of Australia, um, increased atmospheric convection in that part of the world, and an increased chance of rainfall um, really down in an arc from the northwest through to the southeast and Tasmania, um, particularly during. Um, the, the second half of the year. The positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole is a reversal of that pattern. So, <clears throat> excuse me, what we have now is warmer water off the coast of East Africa, um, the, the atmospheric moisture following that warm water, and we have a reduced chance of rainfall over Eastern Australia and parts of Central Australia. Um, leading into the 2019 season, we had a positive phase of the IOD. So that means that in terms of natural variability in the Indian Ocean, it was favouring drier conditions over Australia, pretty much from May through to December. There was a third significant influence um, on, on Australia's climate, or there is a third significant influence on Australia's climate from um, months to um, seasonal timescales, and that's known as the Southern Annular Mode. So the Southern Annular Mode describes the band of westerly winds that circumnavigate um, the, the Antarctic continent. So these winds can either push up closer to the equator or they can contract closer to the Antarctic continent. Um, during a positive phase of the SAM, which is um, described by westerly winds contracting to the south, um, we have a decreased chance of winter rainfall over southern Australia and an increased chance of summer rainfall into parts of New South Wales and Queensland. The opposite of that pattern is known as a neg negative SAM. So what we have um, in, in a negative southern annular mode um, is the, the, the westerly winds pushing up further towards the equator. Um, during winter, we get an increased chance of winter rain However, during spring and summer, we tend to find a decreased chance of summer rain, um, particularly in New South Wales and Queensland, but sometimes into Victoria as well. And leading into the 2019 bushfire season, um, we, we had both a negative SAM and something called a prolonged strat southern stratospheric warming event. Um, that's a, a change in the temperatures above the Antarctic continent that actually acted to prolong um, the, the, the negative SAM. So normally negative SAM doesn't last as long as the IOD or ENSO events. Um, but in this instance, from October to December, we had a persistent negative SAM and a, a decreased chance of um, spring and summer rainfall over Australia. So there's two drivers um, influencing dry conditions in terms of natural modes of variability, um, and that is the IOD, a, a positive IOD, um, and a negative SAM. As well as those natural drivers, we've got trends going on in the background. So the globe is warming and Australia is warming, and that is changing some of the phenomena that, ex that we experience and including those phenomena that impact on drought and fire weather. 
So um, the trends that we're seeing and that are well established now um, are an increased frequency of large scale heat waves and record high temperatures. Um, accompanying that is a longer fire season with more extreme fire danger days. So heat waves are getting longer. Um, their central intensity is getting more intense and they're becoming more frequent. Um, they're particularly arriving earlier in spring. So that is influencing the longer fire season. Um, in terms of that fire season, we've got more fire danger days in that longer season. Um, and we're also finding that the, the most severe fire danger days are becoming more severe. Um, we've got prolonged high ocean temperatures. So this has impacts in the marine environment. Um, and again, it's not just an overall change in sea surface temperatures, it's that we're getting increased um, evidence of marine heat waves that impact on things like the barrier reef and kelp forests around Australia. We've also got trends for reduced average rainfall, particularly over southern and eastern Australia, and particularly during the cooler months of the year. Um, that's really important for the lead into the fire season, as we'll describe. Um, there's other changes going on for which there's emerging evidence. So within that envelope of large background um, natural variability in Australia, we're starting to see evidence of an increase in heavy rainfall. So even in regions where rainfall is expected to decline on average, um, when the meteorology lines up, um, under a warmer world, we would expect more heavy rainfall during those heavy rainfall events than in the past. And the large um, change that will impact on Australia um, that is still coming um, is the increased frequency of coastal storm surge inundation. So as sea levels continue to rise, the impact of coastal storm, um, storm surge inundation on Australia is expected um, to increase. So this is a graph um, looking at how that extreme heat in Australia is changing. So if we're looking at a change in um, Australian average temperature over time, um, that gives us some indicator of a change in, in, in average climate. What we're looking at with um, this particular plot here is a change in the most extreme heat days for, for Australia. So in Australia, we can calculate a national daily temperature, the temperature of the continent, back to around 1910. And being daily temperature, we can put it into its um, um, percentile analysis, the way you might do with exam results, for example, so that we can look at the top 1% of heat days. So the 99th percentile, those 1% those of hot, um, hottest days relative to each month in the year. And we can count those up per year. So this is a plot of how many times the Australian continental temperature each day um, goes into that 99th percentile. So what you can see in the first several decades is evidence of that natural variability. So some decades we don't get any um, um, extreme heat, heat, continental extreme heat days. And then in some decades and some years, you get quite a number of them. Um, what you, you can see since 1980 is that there's a clear trend now in this index. So um, particularly this century, that, that we don't see any years where we don't see days such as this. And we see individual years, um, 2013, which was Australia's warmest year on record, where we got up to 27 days um, in a single calendar year. With, with temperature reaching that 99th percentile. It took several decades to accumulate that, that number of days in the early part of the record. Um, and then along comes 2019 and we see over 40 days. So that is a clear change in the um, type of heat that covers multiple jurisdictions. And it makes a difference to operational agencies, um, including the Bureau, um, whether these events occur once or twice a decade, um, every other year or multiple times per year. It's, it's a big, change in the operational response and the sorts of things that you need to do um, to mitigate risks and respond to risks. So here's just a couple of examples of events that would make it into that graph. So um, what we've got at the top here is the Black Saturday um, heat wave. So um, Black Saturday obviously was um, a tragic fire danger day um, and, and fire day. Um, 173 people lost their lives um, in, in, in the fires in Victoria. Um, during, during um, Black Saturday itself. Um, but it's also instructive to look at the record-breaking heat wave before Black Saturday. So we had temperatures in the mid 40s for several days consecutively um, that really acted to kiln dry the fuel in the forest um, and set up the conditions for that record-breaking day that occurred in February. Um, we broke a lot of all-time daily records across South Australia and Victoria during this event. Um, I've got another event here, which is January 2013. So this is a little bit of a different type of event. We didn't break many individual site records, but when we look at the heat average across the continent, you can see that it's a multi-jurisdictional event. So what we had during this event was 70% of the continent recording temperatures in excess of 42 degrees. 
and we actually broke every national sequential heat record from one day through to one month in January 2013. Um, while that is really significant and we hadn't seen anything like it before, um, January 2019 actually topped it. So um, as, as seen in the graph previously, um, we had a, a number of heat records set in 2013 actually broken um, just uh, six years later. So that really underscores um, the change in the frequency of this type of weather. Um, these events um, are very impactful. So um, the Black Saturday heat wave, as well as impacting on health services, um, it also impacted on the energy sector. Um, and obviously it impacted on the emergency services as well. Um, for an event like January 2013, um, it's a big operational load. Um, you know, you have a lot of um, emergency services around all the states in preparation for over a long period of time. Um, so um, in terms of how you prepare for those, um, if you're the New South Wales RFS or the Bureau, um, it makes a difference how often these events occur. So now we're just going to look at warming over Australia. Um, and I've chosen to um, map here temperatures since the start of this century. So this is um, the 20 year period since 2000. And what we've done is compare that to all other 20 year periods. So the dark oranges here are where temperatures have been highest on record compared to all those other 20 year periods. So you can see almost all of Australia has experienced extreme heat um, over a prolonged period of time. Um, so, and that makes a difference to the background, ecological and built environment settings for the extreme events that occurred during this period. And this is just something that illustrates that. So on the graph on the left, we've got Australian average temperature rising since 1910. So it's about a 1.4 um, increase in temperature over that time. Um, and you can see it's a steady increase since about the 1950s. If you look at December temperatures and so maximum temperatures, daytime temperature for Australia, you can see that there's a trend there, um, but you can also more, um, you can more pronounce, it's more pronounced looking at the extreme events. So um, you can see um, in the early 70s, which is when we had a significant heat wave, um, the, the spike in um, December temperatures compared to the background variability. Um, 2019, we also saw a spike, but then you can also see the influence of the underlying trend so the combination of natural variability pushing December temperatures higher than average, um, combined with that background trend of increasing December temperatures, means that you're more likely to see now and into the future conditions that are unprecedented or those that are beyond our historical record or experience. So this is what December 2019 looks like mapped. So um, again, here compared to all other Decembers, we have highest on record over most of the continent or up in the 90th percentile. Um, particularly along the East Coast and into Victoria. Um, and obviously these are regions which did experience bushfires um, actually from spring, but certainly um, into that um, um, second half of December. We've also experienced trends in rainfall over Australia. So in particular, we've seen drying over um, the Southwest and the Southeast and in the Eastern parts of New South Wales and Queensland this century. Um, these changes are associated with circulation changes in the Southern Hemisphere. So what does that mean? Um, as the globe warms up, um, we're essentially sitting in a more su summertime pattern of rainfall in Australia. Um, during the winter months of the year, normally the cold fronts and cutoff lows um, sweep across the south of the continent and they bring rainfall with them. That's when most of the rain falls. Um, what we see in, in recent decades is that the rain's still falling, but it's falling further south over the Southern Ocean. Um, and that's as the tropics expand, essentially, um, we push those cold fronts away to the south of Australia and we get this signal of very much reduced rainfall. So you can see here lowest on record for this 20 year period compared to all other 20 year periods um, for these red parts of the continent. Um, there are areas where this is offset by increases in summer rain, so parts of New South Wales and Queensland in particular. Um, but it should also be remembered that the, the summer rainfall is highly variable. So um, given that you've got this systematic shift downward in um, um, cooler um, rainfall during the cooler months of the year, what impact might that have if we miss out on the summer monsoon, which, which we quite often do in Australia, and certainly we did um, over um, a number of years recently, which led into that drought. So the drought is naturally occurring. So um, keeping with the theme of this talk, we're gonna talk about the background trends and then the naturally occurring um, um, climate variability on top of that. So um, as I said at the start, drought is naturally occurring in Australia. In this instance, it was driven by um, both a, a long-term 
um, um, influence of lack of rainfall and, and a, um, reduced rainfall from the summer monsoon, but also in 2019, influence from those natural drivers, the IOD and SAM that we talked about earlier. So if we start in January 2018, um, what we've got here is rainfall anomalies or deficiencies. So rainfall below that 1961 to 90 average will appear in the um, um, yellows and, and reds and oranges on this map. So we're just going to animate this from January 2018 and step through month by month, accumulating the rainfall. So we're going to keep adding on the rainfall deficits month by month. So as you can see, looking at the East Coast, we're seeing um, a deepening and spreading of the rainfall deficiencies. So particularly um, in South East Queensland and Northern New South Wales, right down along that South Coast and into East Gippsland, you're seeing um, rainfall deficiencies about 600 millimetres less than what you'd normally get um, over this time period. So that's the naturally occurring drought um, signal that, that we experienced over the, the last couple of years. And that's what that drought looks like in terms of the 21 month rainfall deficiencies. If we go back to the map that we showed earlier of the rainfall decline or the rainfall trends, you can see that some of these drought areas map onto that rainfall decline. So what that means is rather than the drought just being um, an unusually low period of rainfall, um, as with temperature, it tends to become lowest on record or something that's beyond our historical um, experience. And certainly that has an impact on the severity of the conditions that we saw um, over the last um, year or so. So we can combine those two things together. Um, what happens when you have both increasing temperatures and reducing rainfall? Um, this scatter plot here uh, shows um, rainfall and temperature for New South Wales. And New South Wales was the centre of the recent drought. Um, on the horizontal axes, we've got the Keech Byram drought index. So that's the drought index that gets used by um, the Bureau and fire agencies um, as input to their fire danger indices. Um, as we go towards the right on that horizontal axis, we're getting more droughtier, so, so less rainfall um, or drier. And as we go towards the left, um, we're getting to um, um, higher rainfall totals. Um, the vertical axis is um, maximum daytime temperatures. So as we go up that axis, we're getting temperatures that are hotter. Um, so what you can hopefully see here is a relationship between rainfall and temperature in Australia. Um, when it tends to be dry, it also tends to be hot. So as we go towards the right, um, we also tend to go up that vertical axis. Um, as it tends to be wet, it tends to be cooler. And that's largely due to the amount of cloud cover that we experience during those wet periods, but also as the soils um, get more saturated, we tend to get more evaporative cooling just at the surface. So there's this quite neat relationship between rainfall and temperature in Australia. These are dots um, for each year from 1911 to 1999 for New South Wales. I'm now going to add on the next 10 years, so 1999 to 2009. And hopefully what you can see here is that these orange dots that I'm about to introduce are further up that um, vertical axis, so they're warmer than, um, the, 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 the orange, than the yellow dots. You can also see that it still keeps that rainfall relationship. So what we're seeing here is an increase in temperature that is independent of rainfall. This is associated with the background trend in temperatures that's associated with global warming. I can now add the next 10 years, or the most recent 10 years in red, and you can see that they're further up that vertical axis again. So temperatures have increased again in the last decade, um, that combination has also led to extreme events that are unprecedented. So you can see the two dots right up in that right-hand corner, 2019 and 2018. Um, 2019 was the warmest and driest period for the whole of Australia on record. And for New South Wales, you can see they're the two warmest and driest years consecutively. So as we change that underlying background climate setting, we're going to increase the likelihood that we'll see these kind of exceptional conditions that we saw in 2019 and 2018. This makes a big difference for things like fire weather. So what you're having is an ongoing trend in relative humidity. For example, as you increase the temperature, um, you tend to decrease the relative humidity. And so that has an impact on um, the state of the fuel and the propensity for fires to spread. So while we were focused on the events of December and early January 2019, um, 2020, um, it's instructive to go back, since this drought actually was about a three year drought, um, it's instructive to go back to the season before and look at the fire activity that occurred then because it was certainly significant and certainly a talking point um, for the Bureau and the fire agencies over the 2018-2019 season. So Queensland gets its um, fire season a bit earlier than the southern states. Um, as the monsoon tends to kick in around Christmas, it tends to kill off the Queensland fire season. 
So this, uh, these, are, these are fires that occurred in November, um, which is close to the peak of, of their fire season. And this is about a 600 kilometre stretch of coast um, in southern and central Queensland. So um, really significant fire activity um, in some senses um, categorised as unprecedented by QFES and the, and the Queensland fire agencies. Um, and certainly calling for resources from the southern states um, to help manage and combat these fires. Um, that was spring a, a, year, a year before um, the fires that occurred in 2019-2020. As we go into that summer, so um, January 2019, um, what we had was extensive fire activity across not just Tasmania but Victoria as well. So you can see the smoke plumes here um, at the end of January in Tasmania. We had fires pretty much burning from spring through to autumn, um, a huge resource drain. So at the end of these sort of long campaigns, um, you tend to um, start facing the, 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 the um, prospect of not being able to fight all the fires, for example. So um, these are very significant events, but a year before um, the events that occurred um, here. So um, when presenting these um, pictures, and this is again about a three or 400 kilometer um, stretch of coast, um, clearly a lot more fuel was burning um, in these fires. But if you think back to um, the Canberra two, 2003 fires, what we have is a pattern of very significant um, fire danger summits in Australia um, that, that are worsening. And with fires that are behaving in ways that are challenging um, the way we thought about fire activity in Australia previously. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in, in direct relation to the fire danger indices now. So um, in Australia, we use something called the Forest Fire Danger Index or FFDI. It's um, something that accounts for um, rainfall, temperature, um, wind speed, humidity, and a drought factor or, or what's going on with the soils and the fuels. Um, it's a very good indicator, a general indicator for um, um, the, the difficulty or fires that are difficult to contain once they get going. So um, our fire danger ratings um, that we give out warnings um, are, are based basically on, on, on the FFDI. Um, if you look at a trend in FFDI, so this is accumulated FFDI, um, the reds and oranges here are where we have a longer fire season, more fire danger days during that season, and more severe fire danger days um, than we did in the past. You can see the largest changes here and in the annual um, FFDI occur in um, parts of the Murray-Darling Basin, so, so parts where there's rather less fuel but there's a general increase um, over most parts of Australia. If we isolate spring and then we look at the relative change, so that means the change in FFDI changed compared to the average spring conditions by location, you can see that there's a larger relative change now in some of the more heavily forested regions of Southern Australia. Um, so it's really significant that this is occurring in what was a shoulder season. Um, and that it's occurring in parts of the country where there is actually quite a lot of fuel to burn. Um, and this is, um, you can see that that also includes um, southeast Queensland as well. So this is an attempt to show the earlier start to that season. Um, and here we're looking at the south coast of New South Wales. Um, it's very similar for East Gippsland. So um, what we're doing here is tracking the arrival of the first significant fire danger day, so um, FFDI above 25 or of very high fire danger. Um, for the south coast of New South Wales, what this plot shows is that in the 1950s, that first fire danger day was occurring around December or, or, or November or late spring, early summer. Um, and it's now occurring in late winter, early spring. So we're bringing that forward by several months. Um, this has large implications for a range of things. So um, there was a Tartha fire in um, late autumn 2018, um, where you know the, the, the um, assets that we, the aerial assets that we used to fight those fires that we share with North America, weren't in the country at that time. Um, similarly, for this Bega Valley fire that occurred in August 2018, um, some of our elite firefighting um, units were, were in North America fighting fires. So their season's getting longer as well. Um, that has implications for our asset sharing. Um, and it doesn't occur in isolation to what else is going on in the world. So with COVID-19, for example, um, we're going to find it difficult to actually share assets with North America in the coming fire season. Um, but this shrinking in fire, uh, this expanding of the fire season and the shrinking of the season in which you can do burn off um, and manage fire fuel loads potentially um, is one of the biggest impactors on management of fire in Australia. <laughs> 
So um, we're now going to sort of review all the different things that influence that um, those fire events in, at the end of the year. Um, so this is the trend plus the climate variability that we're looking at. So in the background, we had long-term climate trends, so warming and drying. Um, we had a multi-year drought, which is a natural event. Um, we had a positive IOD, so influencing warmer and drier conditions. And we had a negative SAM. So all of those things all pushed in the same direction. And what that meant is we didn't just see extreme conditions. We saw conditions that were, in some senses, well beyond our historical experience. So this is the accumulated FFDI, so summed up over um, September. Um, and I'm going to animate this stepping forward. But fires started in the landscape um, at the start of spring. And you can see by the time we got to December, when we accumulate that fire weather over the entire period, um, you can see that it's most of the country and including the south coast in East Gippsland where we had highest on record fire danger. And this is a little bit, um, I've just chosen southeast Queensland here to show you again the trend in the extreme. So we know um, the annual um, FFDI days, the number of days above 25 in Queensland is going up. Um, you can see that trend that's occurred since 1990 on the left for the whole of the state. Um, and then in um, southeast Queensland, we're looking at 2019 there, and you can see this spike in 2019. So there's a, there's a background trend, there's natural variability, and there's this um, event that's well beyond not, not just the trend, but our historical experience. Um, that's probably an influence of what's going on in the months earlier as well. So it's not necessary for December to show a really um, strong trend. Um, if we're getting changes in the preceding months, then it increases the chances that in one of those months, you'll see an event um, such as we've seen in 2019, for example. So um, again, that's that influence of trend and background variability that we've talked about. Um, if we look at December 2020 mapped, um, you can now see in dark orange here areas of the country that experience their highest on record fire danger index. So um, that includes parts of southern Victoria um, into eastern New South Wales, parts of South Australia. You can see Kangaroo Island um, on this map. You can see East Gippsland. Um, you can see northern New South Wales. So, and you can see um, around the ACT there and, and into the south coast. Um, you can also see regions where we didn't get ignition, luckily, um, over, over that period. So if we did, um, in places like um, southwestern Victoria, um, parts of southeastern South Australia and Tasmania, then it would have stretched us further. And just to end a review of what happened um, leading into those events, um, what we're now looking at is just emphasising the role of long-term drying and drought. So um, on the top two panels here, the rainfall de deficiencies from January 2017 through to December 2019. Um, and you can see these reds and pinks on this, on this map where we've got lowest on record rainfall deficiencies, um, particularly in East Gippsland there where quite a lot of the forest ended up burning. Um, deficiencies from July to December 2019, you can see we're now picking out the south coast. So that background setting of drought um, is one of the, the main preconditions that influence the sorts of fires that we've seen in 2019 and in preceding summers such as, such as Black Saturday. Um, on the bottom panel, I'm just emphasizing that the, that the highest temperatures don't need to occur on the fire danger day. So um, what we had um, were record temperatures on the 28th of December, but we also had record temperatures um, in the middle of December. So a little bit like that heat wave ahead of Black Saturday, what we've done is um, precondition the fuel, um, really dried it out. Um, you might have had a prolonged heat wave where it didn't get so cool at night, and sometimes that cooling at night gets a little bit of moisture back into the fuel, but you don't get those relieving events when you have a series of heat waves. And so that highest fire danger day that occurred um, in, in, at the end of December, um, where we had record fire danger, um, we didn't necessarily need to have the highest daily maximum temperatures during that period. Um, something I should also um, mention about that early start to the fire season. So in terms of managing these fires, um, it makes a difference if the fire season starts earlier and you get ignition earlier. So if you have fires already burning in the landscape um, from October, um, when these fire danger days come along, we don't need to just worry about new ignitions. We may need to worry about several fires that are already burning. And again, that has a big um, impact on the way we dedicate our resources um, to managing and fighting these fires. Um, a note here on fire generated thunderstorms. So um, these are really significant events for those that manage critical infrastructure or services um, that respond to fighting fires. So um, 
since Canberra 2003, there's been an apparent increase in the number of fire events that are associated with these fire generated thunderstorms or pyroaccumulating nimbus. Um, that means that where there's enough fuel and the fire is big enough, it's generating its own weather. And what that does is it changes winds at the fire front and the loft, so up higher in the atmosphere. Um, it increases the transport of burning embers, so it, it helps spread fires beyond that fire front. Um, it's associated with dry lightning um, or lightning, um, and that increases the ignition points. Um, and right um, at the ground, it can cause quite extreme winds and tornadoes. So um, we had a fire truck um, flip on the um, Victoria New South Wales border, probably associated with the tornado um, that's associated with one of these fire generated thunderstorms. And as mentioned, um, Black Saturday, Canberra 2003, um, these are some of the things that influence why we, why we are seeing a change in um, fire weather at, at the fire front in Australia. So just to summarise, um, we've got longer fire seasons arriving earlier in spring, most notably, um, accompanied by um, more extreme heat waves. So including in spring, those two things are very deeply connected. Um, we have lower rainfall during the cooler months um, in some fire prone regions, um, particularly the southwest and the southeast, leading into that um, period. Um, hotter drought periods as well. So when we get droughts, we tend to have um, hotter droughts, which has um, uh, some impact on, on the amount of moisture in the landscape. Um, and evidence for more favourable environments for fire generated thunderstorms as well. So we're just going to switch now to look at what we need to do to scenario plan for the future. So we know that these trends are going on in the background. We know from our projections that those trends are likely to continue. So what do we need to do to manage that physical climate risk um, to, to, to mitigate that and, and to um, um, work towards disaster risk reduction? So um, I've got a plot here that could be applied to any service. So um, this could relate to um, the national electricity market. Um, it could relate to any utility. Um, but generally um, what we have is if this is an events based risk assessment um, on the horizontal axes, I've got events that are high in probability, um, but low in consequence. So um, generally when we run a service, whether it's water or power, um, we have a large attention on making sure that that service is reliable. So we don't want um, a whole lot of mundane issues in the trans, um, transmission or distribution network um, to cause outages. So we will go to some measures to make sure that we have reliable supply of that utility. Um, in the green here, we've got um, lower probability and higher consequence events. Sometimes they're called HILP events, high impact, low probability events. Um, they occur less often, but the consequences can be higher. They're also more expensive to make yourself either resilient or resistant to. So resistant means um, no matter what you throw at the system, it won't fall over. Um, resilience generally means that you can throw something at the system, it'll fall over, um, but it's got a good chance and ability to recover from that. Um, these are historically more difficult to do because they're more expensive. Um, they also may come up against um, market or regulation rules in terms of costs passed on, in this case, to the consumer, if you're thinking about um, the transmission network. Um, and they often um, are events that are at the edges or just beyond in, in, under a climate change world, our historical experience, and that makes them difficult to respond to in real time. The important thing though, under climate change, if you consider where these two bubbles sit, um, they will shift. So um, we will have more probable and higher impact um, extreme events, particularly compound extreme events, where we get multiple um, extremes occurring at once. And we'll also shift that reliability bubble as well. So we'll have a higher probability and potentially higher consequence of events that are currently manageable. Um, so the question is, what do we do about um, addressing that resilience? Um, as the consequence gets higher and as the probability increases, um, it's no longer the case that we can just leave that to something that occurs every once or um, you know, decade or 20 years. Um, we now need a risk management plan to look at those things. So when we talk about scenarios, um, often, when people think about climate change and they have some exposure to the science, um, they'll think about emission scenarios. So this is Australian temperatures. The black line here is observed Australian temperatures over the 20th century and the start of the 21st um, um, century um, increasing over time. So the warmest year on record there is marked out in 2019. Um, the plumes that go from there are basically what would happen to Australian temperatures under different um, global emission scenarios. So, um, here, RCP 8.5 is a business as usual emission scenario, and you can see Australian temperatures warming um, quite dramatically um, over the course of the 21st century. Um, the green there is RCP 2.6, which is 
um, a theoretical emission scenario where we stabilise and reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. For managing risk over the next 10 or 20 years, the important thing to um, factor in here is that um, we are going to respond to emissions that are already in the atmosphere. So there's a lag between the oceans warming and the emissions in the atmosphere, which means um, up until about 2030 or 2040, we're going to continue to warm to, to greenhouse gases that are already up there um, in, in the atmosphere. And that means that the conditions that we're seeing now actually become about average um, by 2040. So all of the things I've just described, rather than being really unusual, start to become um, more common. Um, in the future, what that means is if we follow that business as usual emission scenario, then sometime later this century, um, the conditions we're seeing now, those extreme ones I've just described, become unusually cool um, relatively. And so that's where we have an adaptation um, imperative on us for the, the decade or two in front of us. Um, and then there's a global mitigation um, imperative in front of us to avoid um, some of those higher um, glo global and Australian temperatures in the future. So that's an emission scenario. When we're talking about adaptation, however, um, we're, we're quite often talking about a scenario in a different sense. So this is an example of that. We're now looking at scenarios for future fire weather climatology and climatology is fire weather averaged over, um, in this case, a 20 year period. So when we look out into the future with um, three models here, um, there's the CSIRO regional climate model, um, there's a global climate model um, and a UNSW regional climate model. And we're looking at fire weather um, for 2060, 2079 compared to 1990, 2009, based on high emission scenarios. So you can see here um, in the reds and pinks, um, a change in the number of days at the extreme end above the 95th percentile for FFDI um, and a change in days just above FFDI 25 for that indicator that we've used previously. Um, you can also see little uh, blobs of white here. That doesn't mean no change in fire weather. It means that's where the range of simulations that were run didn't necessarily agree on signs. So if you ran it 10 times, you might have got six that showed um, an increase in fire weather and four that showed a decrease. And that just underscores that there's uncertainty in some of these and some of that is real. Um, you know, there's a chance that you would get um, more easterly flow into um, higher parts of eastern New South Wales with more humidity potentially that far out into the future. But what we know um, over the next bit is that we're probably likely to see um, an increase in the risk of fire danger over most parts of the southeast and southwest. So that leads us to a next type of scenario. So we've looked at global emission scenarios We've looked at a change in overall fire weather climatology over, over a 20 year period. And now we're projecting um, future extreme heat over, uh, um, over days. So rather than looking at um, the globe or a chunk of Australia over 20 years, we're now looking at snapshots, um, a week's worth of weather um, um, into the future. So I've just referenced those two heat wave events that I talked about earlier, January, 2000, January, February, 2009. So the Black Saturday heat wave and that January 2013 heat wave. So you can see those here rendered by the Bureau's weather model um, as two um, heat waves where temperatures are pushing up into the high 40s. Um, we find a similar event um, synoptically, so meteorologically, um, in the Bureau's weather model applied to a future climate scenario. So for 2050, you can see a similar type of event um, has much more extensive high temperatures, um, largely in inland areas, but you can actually see parts of the coast in South Australia um, where those temperatures start to affect um, populated areas as well. Um, while this says 2050, um, it's important to know that you're not using these scenarios to say this is what is going to occur in January 2050. Um, you're running these simulations many times. You might find this event in 2050. In another model, you might find it in 2035. In another model, you might have to wait till 2080 to find an event like this. That obviously presents a difficulty for someone who is managing a consequence of these type of events that's very high. So you need to balance an understanding of likelihood against an understanding of consequence. So if the consequence of these events are really high, then it's important to know that actually they can occur potentially in the next 10 year period. And if they do, potentially you need to stress test your system for these type of events using this type of scenario. Um, so that's the three types of scenario hopefully I've covered reasonably well there. And that's where my talk ends. Um, yep, no, you've done fine. There's a few questions in the chat for you. Um, so could you please explain how climate change is affecting the frequency and severity of IOD, SAM and El Nino events? And I just need to get back into, sorry, I'm trying to, 
get back to my, oh, hang on, I'm still screen sharing, that's what the problem is. Yes, all right. Um, and in the chat, so sorry, Rebecca, can you just go back again? All oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, look, um, ha th those natural modes of variability can't continue to operate the way that they have in the past. As we continue to add and heat to the oceans and the oceans are taking up um, a lot of the additional energy from additional greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is working to warm those oceans. So we know that those modes can't stay the same as we continue to um, progress along global warming. Um, exactly how they will change is actually quite difficult to work out. So um, what we potentially see is increased heavy rainfall over northern Australia, but larger variability in that. So um, while you might get offsets in summer rain for some of those southern drying events, what happens when we don't get that rain? That's essentially what we've seen over the last three years. While we've had increases in monsoonal rainfall, we didn't get that rain over the three years and we have those drying trends in the south. Um, so um, in terms of what happens with the IOD that we just saw was one of the strongest on record. Um, the SAM event was very unusual and the El Nino events tend to be occurring with, with hotter temperatures. Um, but what it means for the frequency and that sort of modulation, I think is still very much a research question. Okay, um, the next one said something like, you've got a great slide on resilience versus reliability. Have you got examples or case studies of electricity sector investments to increase resilience to low probability slash high consequence events? Um, so I guess that's the process that we're going through now with the Energy Sector Climate Information Project with AMO and the department and CSIRO. Um, look, certainly we've worked um, additionally to that with some of um, the transmission networks where we are looking at, you know, what that, what that means for asset specification. Um, I think there are people now looking at what it means for some of the generation assets um, as well in terms of, you know, highest maximum temperatures, um, whether you have um, wind farm, wind farms that, um, and, and other renewable um, plant that is um, susceptible to those. But I think as everyone in, in the NEM really appreciates now, um, with that mix of renewables, what we've got is a challenge that we have both demand and supply now being influenced by um, weather and climate. So um, I think really what we're doing now is laying the groundwork for some better planning processes um, going forward and some better information for investment decisions in the NEM. Um, can you comment about Australia's likelihood of achieving the Paris targets, either 1.5 or 2 degrees? Um, it's not actually my area. Uh, so look, what I would say is there is a large signal in both the Paris Agreement and the TCFD. So this Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures um, is a G20 instrument of the financial regulators where we're now um, you know, basically every listed company around the world is, is um, going through a process of um, understanding its exposure to, to climate risk and how it's going to deal with that. Um, that means there's a really large market signal globally and in Australia towards reduced emissions. Um, so um, I, I couldn't comment on how, whether we're going to meet our targets or not, but certainly I'm confident that we probably won't follow that business as usual high emission scenario, either in Australia or globally due to a number of social and policy and economic settings. The point I'd like to make on that though, is the shift towards a lower emissions um, um, economy in Australia um, is certainly costly, but is nowhere near um, the impact of failure to adapt to climate change in Australia. So that is gonna be a multi-trillion dollar bill for Australia to be actually ready for the, the impacts of climate change. and. And in that area, we do not have strong market signals actually forcing us to do that resilience planning um, for our infrastructure and our transport and our energy um, and our emergency services um, and the Bureau services as well. So um, from where I sit at the Bureau, I really, really emphasize that we need to uplift our, um, our resilience planning. Um, we tend to throw over 90% of our disaster planning tends to get um, thrown at the warning response and rebuild. Um, when you go to somewhere like the Netherlands, um, there's about over 90% of that disaster budget gets spent on mitigation and disaster risk reduction. So we need to really shift what we're doing here 
Otherwise, what we'll be faced with, with is an unconstrained future cost from natural disaster builds in Australia. Um, we've got two questions about sharing your slide pack. Are you able to share your slide pack, including the missing IOD slide? Then, provided we acknowledge the source, can we present material to other stakeholders? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Good. Um, and then there's a comment which says, um, the 1.5 and 2 degree targets are global targets, but of course Australia would need to make its contribution. Yeah, and don't forget, um, 1.5 and 2 degrees for the globe is um, a higher um, level of warming for the continents and Australia. So the global average includes the oceans. Um, when you look at temperatures over land under those targets, they're actually higher than that. Yep, uh, that's all the questions that are in the chat for the moment. Um, so if there aren't any more, um, Okay, um, so, so, so that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Um, I'd really like to thank Carl for presenting such an interesting and informative webinar. And also um, to everyone who's attended for your time and your questions. Um, there were some technical issues during the webinar, so if possible, a recording of today's webinar will be made available on the ESCII page of the Climate Change in Australia website. Um, if you have any questions about today's webinar or the ESCI project, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, my email address is in the webinar confirmation email. Um, make sure you look out for the next ESCI webinar, details of which will be distributed shortly. Thanks again for attending and we look forward to seeing you at the next, next ESCI project webinar. Thanks. Thanks everyone.